stone that we are hearing from. Fedor is speaking, and he's speaking to Coming in contact with Maitreya Muni here, and he's referring to, O oh my Lord, in the previous verses, O oh great sage, O oh great sage. And now he's talking about the Supreme Lord. Translation, he lies down on his own heart, spread in the form of the sky, and thus placing the whole creation in that space. He expands himself into many living entities which are manifested as different species of life. He does not have to endeavor for his maintenance because he is the master of all mystic powers and the proprietor of everything. Thus, he is distinct from the living entities. Hmm. Very technical. Maybe we should read it again. He can try to absorb you. He lies down on his own heart, spread in the form of the sky. He lies down on his own heart, spread in the form of the sky. And thus place, placing the whole creation in that space. And thus placing the whole creation in that space. He expands himself into many living entities. He expands himself into many living entities. Which are manifest as different species of life. Which are manifest as he does not have to endeavor for his maintenance, because he is the master of all mystic powers and the proprietor of everything. Thus he is distinct from the living entities. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Again, this is a little technical, so you need to really try to understand what Prabhupada is saying. The questions regarding creation, maintenance, destructions, which are mentioned in different parts of the Bhagavatam, are in relationship to different millenniums, kalpas, and therefore they are differently described by different authorities when questioned by different students. So what Prabhupada is saying is that these three activities of the Supreme Lord, which he manifests through his three manifestations of himself, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, happen regularly. They're called millenniums, kalpas, but different students describe it in different ways. He doesn't say that one is right and one is wrong. What he's saying is that there are details in the descriptions that are different from millennium to millennium. Here, there is no difference regarding the creative principles of the Lord's control over them, yet there is some difference in the minute details because of the different kalpas. Okay, so there's the answer. The gigantic sky is the material body of the Lord called the Virat Rup, and all material creations are resting on the sky or the heart of the Lord. So the heart of the Lord in the sky is considered to be synonymous. Interesting. Therefore, beginning from the sky, the first material manifestations, manifestation of the gross vision, down to earth, everything is called Brahman. Interesting. Although it takes on material elements, it's still called Brahman. We'll get into that. Sarvam ikalam midam brahman. There is nothing but the Lord. Hmm. Do we believe that? There's nothing but the Lord. So that's a hard on principle because do we make distinctions for the sake of understanding? There's nothing but the Lord. <laughs> okay. The living entities, uh, there's, and he is one without a second. So there's no one as great as him, no one is equal to him. The living entities are the superior energies, whereas matter is inferior. Okay, two more elements of the Lord's energy. Us and matter. One is superior and one is inferior. And the combination of these energies bring about the, mess, the manifestation of this material world, which is the heart of the Lord. Wow. 
Did you get that? <laughs> okay. Om Gyan Timbadanda Sya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pacharine Never Say Sasunyavari Pastyatyare Satarine Vanchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pe Bacha Patita Anam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Srivas and Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Chila Prabhupada Ki Okay, so hmm. it's talking a little bit about the manifestations of creation in this particular aspect of the Lord's function and functionary. Does the Lord touch the material energy? No, He never touches the material energy, but yet He controls it through His different energies. Here we're getting a little bit about the Dvarat group. The Virat Rup is a imaginary manifestation of the, the transcendental body of the Lord as it's, as it's formulated in relationship to the uh, material energy. So for, for instance here you'll see, which is definitely mentioned, the sky is the heart of the Lord. <laughs> the sky is the heart of the Lord. So everything comes from the heart, so the sky is the initial element by which the whole material manifestation unfolds. And as mentioned here, ultimately the complete manifestation comes when it comes to the earthy element. When it hits the earthly element, then everything is formulated on the material level. But it starts with the most subtle of all of the elements, which is the sky. And here is compared to be the heart of the earth. So what is being said here is that although there is a, a very systematic material uh, expansion of the different creative functions that make up the material energy from subtle going all the way to gross, from sky to air, from air to fire, from fire to water, from water to earth, and then you have the entire creation and all of the elements that connect with each of these original elements are manifested as simultaneously, so just like the sky. The sky is ether. So ether is the most subtle and sound travels through ether. Sound travels through ether. If there was no ether, there'd be, you couldn't hear anything. <laughs> Even, even science, they even, even know that, that the, the, the radio waves, television images are traveling through the etherical element from one place to another. Now you can, you can see images on these electronic devices. So these electronic devices are really quite good because they uh, they've somehow or other discovered that through the ethereal element, they can project images and through sound. <laughs> And Prabhupada said, if there was no ether, you would clap your hand and be no, there would be no sound. <laughs> so the fact that there's sound is, means that that's the ethereal element. And that is the sound element. And sound, where, where does sound come from? Where does sound be picked up? From the ear. So three things are manifested. The ethereal element, the sound, and the source of how the sound is picked up, the ear. And then from that comes the next element is um, air. Air is touch. <laughs> you can feel the air when the air blows, and then you get some sensation on your skin. The skin is the element of touch sensation where you can pick up that. And the uh, air is the movement of uh, that energy from the, uh, the touch, the touch, the experience of the touch and then the air itself. So as air moves, you can, if there was no air, there would be no sensation when, when you touch something. <laughs> yeah. 
then from that comes fire. Fire is sight. You get fire element sight, and the sight is the eye. So the fire element is the element of the next. From you see, from subtle to gross, material creation is manifesting. And then comes fire is sight, which means illumination and vision. And then the eye is the element that picks it up. And then the next is water. Water is taste, and taste is the next element. And water is, um, yeah, that's the next element down from fire, is water. And then water has taste, and taste is by the tongue. So you taste things by the tongue. And then the next comes the earthy element, which is smell. All smell comes from the earth. You plant a seed in the ground, you put a rose seed in the ground, and then the rose flower comes up and then has a particular sound, uh, smell that is called gandha. Gandha means sound, uh, f um, smell. And so every s aromic, either pungent, pleasing, or foul aroma comes from the earth. So all of these sensations and the objects to pick up the sensations and the, sens and the elements themselves are expanded by the Supreme Lord as he creates the energy. And how does he do that? He simply glances over the uh, Pradhan. Pradhan is the unmanifested energy of the Lord in its aggregate state. It's called Haranyagarbo, it's another name for it. It's like a golden egg. And all the elements are in there, along with the, the 25 elements are there. Uh, the, the senses, the mind, the, uh, the sense objects, the different elements as we mentioned, all of that is in an aggregate state. But nothing can move without the touch of spirit. And this is a very important part to understand. The scientists say that combinations of matter make um, actually produce life. They say you put, if when, when, when matter moves in a certain direction, just like a man and woman come together and then there's, <coughs> there's life. So they say, well, and then they describe the different secretions and how the embryo gets, uh, gets fertilized by the secretions and then life comes. But they don't understand, but behind that whole thing, the spirit soul is there. Without the spirit soul, there's no life because nothing can move without the spirit soul. And the spirit soul is actually the energy of the Lord for this element of creation. In other words, everything is moving by the Lord's connection with the spiritual energy and everything moves. Otherwise, matter is just simply dead. <laughs> Nothing happens. Matter is just like, just like this used to be part of a tree. Now the tree at one point was alive. And now that tree is no longer, this is no longer connected to the tree. The tree was, is life itself, because we know that tree actually is another one of the species of life. And so now this wood that was once parts of a tree is now separated from its source and therefore it's no life. So how does it move? I move it. <laughs> Spirit moves it. In other words, you have to have a living entity to make matter act and interact. Otherwise, there is no life. And therefore, the scientific theory is that simply com combining matter in different ways produces life is faulty. Because all their theories are based on the interactions of the elements without the understanding of the spiritual energy. And therefore, everything they say is wrong <laughs> because they miss the essential point, which is spirit, like that. And you'll see here, Krishna describes, or it's being described about Krishna, that the sky is the heart of the Lord. So for those persons who are very grossly, uh, their minds are very grossly uh, formulated, you might say, when we show them, you know, we say the Lord exists, they say, well, let me see. And then we show them the deity and they say, well, you just manufacture that. So 
we say, all right, there's another way you can understand. Just see this material energy as the body of the Lord and the different parts of the material energy are actually the different parts of the body of the Lord. It's for mostly for non-devotees and for atheists also that actually this, this material energy also has a form, but it's an imaginary form and it's the actually corresponds with the transcendental body of the Lord. So the Lord's heart is the sky. And the trees are the hairs on his bodies. <laughs> the, the mountains are his bones. Uh, the, um, the lakes, oceans are his abdomen. So in this way, and in, in you'll see, it'll, it'll get into this description in the third canto here, and also part of it was described in the second canto, on how the one can see the Lord, or at least imagine the form of the Lord through the material energy. And it's not, in one sense, it's not an imaginary sense because everything is coming from the Lord, as it says here in this particular statement. There's nothing outside of the Lord. Just like you have the sun, and then you have the energy of the sun, which is the sunshine. So the sunshine has no existence without the sun. <laughs> you can't have sunshine unless you have the sun. So the sun is the source of the sunshine. So all of the energies that are working in this material world and in the spiritual world also, are also coming from a particular source, and that source is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So everything is, in one sense, God and not God. <laughs> that makes sense? <laughs> if you tell somebody that, they'll, they say, well, that's contradictory. It is just, and we can use that example of the sun to explain that analogy. And what is that example? Is that we also say that, well, the sun has come into my room, but the sun's not in your room. If it was, you wouldn't be there, and neither would your room. <laughs> the sunshine, which is the energy of the sun, has come, and therefore, as we say, the sun has come. So the sunshine and the sun, in one aspect of understanding, is the same. There's no difference. But then again, you can't say the sun and the sunshine is the same. It's obviously different. So in the same way, all of the energies of the Lord are Him at the same time, not Him. They are Krishna and not Krishna simultaneously. So the, the philosophy that we understand is achintya beta beta tattva, beta abed. Beta beta tattva means that everything is simultaneously one with and different from the Lord. In one lecture, Srila Prabhupada was saying, and you are Krishna. <laughs> yeah. And I am Krishna. And the devotees almost fell off their chairs when they were hearing Prabhupada speaking like that. Prabhupada started getting into the oneness of, re of, the, of existence. That everything is Krishna. You're Krishna. I'm Krishna. This is Krishna. This is Krishna. Everything is, everything is Krishna. And then, you know, then the questions and answers came, and then Prabhupada said, no, no, we're not Krishna, but we are the energy of Krishna, and therefore his energy and him are non-different, but he's also different. If we think we're Krishna, would that mean we're, we're, we're actually an illusion? But we're not separate from Krishna because we're of the same nature as Krishna. So when... And this point is, is very important to understand. Why? Because everything is God. <laughs> and, and those who have that understanding treat everything in that way. They treat the material energy as being the energy of the Lord. Therefore, they don't misuse it, or abuse it, or neglect it. They understand it has a purpose because it is, in one sense, non-different from the Lord. And the non-difference can only be understood when we amalgamate the difference with the non-difference in the form of devotional service. Does that make sense? In other words, as soon as you connect the energy with the source through devotional service, 
then the energy again takes on its uh, spirit, pure spiritual nature. So there's no such thing as matter. Matter doesn't exist. We use that term simply for, for understanding separatist, separateness or difference, but ultimately, because Krishna can't produce anything spiritual. I mean, I'm sorry, material. He is pure spirit, and whatever he produces is spiritual. Even from the scientific point of view, the, the, um, the scientists have come up with some correct, they say, matter can never be created or destroyed. And they're right, because matter is eternal, but not the forms. The, the elements which make up the forms are eternal. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, you can't destroy them. They are pure spiritual energy in their initial inception as they come to the material world and then expand themselves in the same sense of their existence. In other words, they expand themselves more and more. But everything is spiritual. When you understand that, you're happy. <laughs> we make a distinction for the sake of function, but we ultimately we know everything is spiritual. Why? Because everything is coming from Krishna. But we're not pantheists. The pantheists think that everything is spiritual, therefore everything is worshipable. So the floor is worshipable, the dog is worshipable, the, uh, you know, the building is worshipable. No. <laughs> These are elements that are, in their pure sense, spiritual, but because they're cut off, they are not worshipable. They're only reconnected to their source by devotional service. Then they become, then they take on their spiritual nature or spiritual definition again. So it's very important to understand this, that everything is Krishna. And at the same time, everything is not Krishna. <laughs> And when you do, when you have that, then you treat each other, teach everyone in that same way, with respect or with the understanding that this person, although he has a particular, she has a particular body and they have a particular personality, ultimately they belong to Krishna. And in one sense, they're never separated from Krishna. Even the elements that make up the body, which disintegrate, the elements don't discriminate, disintegrate, the forms disintegrate. And they, and, th and those elements are eternal. Interesting. It's like, if you, you can see it. If you take water, you put it on a fire in a pan, what does it turn in? It turns into gas, which is another element, that's all. And so you, know, you can change the forms of the elements, but you can't destroy the atomic structure, which is the basis of each of the elements. You just rearrange the atomic structure to produce something different, that's all. Yeah, so matter can never be... Con and Krishna is so intricately connected with everything that Prabhupada would say he's between every atom and he's in within every atom. You can't get away from Krishna. <laughs> it's impossible. He's everywhere. <laughs> and, every, and even you are Krishna, as he said, because you, as a spirit soul, are part and parcel of Krishna, just like the sunshine is part of the sun. So in that sense, we are connected with Krishna. We never lose that connection. The part can never be separated from the whole. But what is the separation? That is called maya, or illusion. Thinking oneself separate from God is, is what is called maya or illusion. And therefore, acting in that false sense of separateness causes us to struggle in this material world. As soon as we realize we're never separated from Krishna and that that connection is reawakened by devotional service. And I use the word reawakened because that connection has always been there. Krishna is always aware of that, but we aren't. We forget our relationship with him, and we think that we have more relationships with the things in this world than we do with God. <laughs> but these things in this world are also his energy also. <laughs> so. And even the body that we have, which changes its form at the time of death, it disintegrates, 
those elements also, as we mentioned, are coming from the original source. So in one sense, they're non-different. Now Prabhupada also goes on to explain that with creation, maintenance, and destructions, there are different authorities and there are different students who learn from these different authorities and they have different understandings of how these three things take place. So you might find that there apparently says that while well, the creation worked in this way and this particular creation, but then again, you'll find other sources, other spiritual sources will say, it's like this. And Prabhupada makes the point, it, both are correct, because during the different manifestations and creations, destructions, there are details that are different, but the element, the same is that the source is the same, and that is Krishna. He is the original. He's Adi Purusha, Govindam Adi Purusha Tamaham Bajami. Ishwara Parma Krishna Sachit Ananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarva Karna Karnam. That's the point. Sarva Karna Karnam. He is the cause of all causes and he is both the remote cause and the initial cause. He's, you can see him as the remote cause, but you can't see him, I mean as the initial cause, but you can't see him as the remote cause. Because behind the scenes, everything is happening by Krishna. But when one gets transcendental vision through pure devotional service, then one can see how everything is working under the hand of the Lord. It becomes clear. <laughs> Nothing can move. And when you understand that, you think, well, what else is there to do but devotional service? That's the point. <laughs> That's the main point. Material activities are some kind, just a type of illusion that the conditioned souls take on, thinking that their material body and through the material activities they feel that they can enjoy some kind of happiness or satisfaction. But it's an illusion because everything is not, everything is not, is, is spiritual. And what is material means to cut it off from the source, that's all. Prabhupada would use the example of finger is very valuable. It has a very important part in, in the function of the body. But if you take that finger and you cut it off and you put it somewhere else, no longer connected to the body, this finger is useless. So we're useless when we're cut off from Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to say that We're, I'm not calling you useless but <laughs> hopefully you get back to Krishna that's the idea but when we're connected with Krishna we have value and we have everything we need to fulfill our our existence as a supreme being as a source of this I mean the energy of the supreme being becomes automatically given by that connection <laughs> And when we're cut off, we're miserable <laughs> because it's a false state of consciousness. So what is the difference between being connected and cut off? And one, there's, it's only one thing. It's called uh, consciousness. See, what's the difference between um, sleeping and waking? It's consciousness, that's all. You're the same person whether you're sleeping or whether you're waking. But in one state of existence, you're not aware of certain things. In another state, you're aware of other things. So it's a matter of awareness, that's all. <laughs> so when we come to that stage that we can never be connect disconnected from Krishna, and everything is his energy, and everything belongs to him, and he's controlling everything, mayadakshena prakriti suyate sachyadachana, he controls everything, we think we're in control, but we're not. He gives you a little sense of the idea that you can control things just so you can somehow use that independence to you to control things to come back to him in devotional service, that's all. He gives us that free will. That's the only thing that separates us from Krishna is this false sense of independence. But it's called free will. It's like... You know, the, the father is uh, working with the child 
and the father is guiding the child, but then the father lets the child do something on its own to see if the child can do something productive, just to teach them. And he's teaching the child how to walk or how to do things. And then the child does something wrong. <laughs> And so, you know, the father is not going to, he still, the child is still connected to the father. And the, fa the, the child thinks, well, I'm doing something different and therefore because I'm different than the father, I can do something different. So we think we're separate from Krishna, but we're not. We're never separate. Never. At any stage of existence, you're always connected with Krishna. But we have a choice how to connect with Krishna, whether through his external energy or through the internal energy, which is devotional service, like that. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so this, this point is very important to understand because it is the basis of, it, of life's existence. So we use our intelligence to, you, to reconnect ourselves and everything that we come in contact with Krishna. Yeah. Yeah. What is that as a particular... That real renunciation means to use everything in the service of the Lord. That's renunciation. To give up something or to, uh, to somehow neglect something that could be used in the service of the Lord and calling it renunciation is another false sense of renunciation. In other words, I'm not going to use this. I mean, well, there are certain things you have to give up which are extraneous to your actual existence. In other words, you'd have to give up sinful activities. Well, what are sinful activities? They have, that's darkness, that's all it is. Just like, do sinful activities have any substance? No, there is no substance to it at all. Just like we're in this room and it's got lights, so when you take the lights out of the room, the room's still here, but now it becomes dark. So does darkness have any substance? No, simply the absence of light, that's all. And people say, well, what is evil? Evil is the absence of good. What is sin? Sin is the, ap is the wrong activity of a, of a living entity, that's all. And it therefore has no substance. It doesn't exist. <laughs> in the real sense of the term. So, therefore, connect everything back to Krishna in devotional service, and that is the perfection of life. And that requires guidance and intelligence because of the conditioned soul's uh, conditioning to use everything in their own, I, how they think it should be used. In other words, for my own benefit like that. And we use everything for Krishna's benefit. We benefit also because we're never separated from Krishna. And then we can experience that connection. And as soon as we use things for our own selfish interests, then we are again exasperating or continuing to, to cut, keep that, that illusionary idea that I'm disconnected. That's all. <laughs> but I'm never disconnected. <laughs> Make sense? Did I say anything that, that didn't make sense? Just checking. I mean, just because, you know, you guys are my checkpoints. <laughs> it uh, makes sense. Huh? It makes sense. Makes sense, okay. Only this part with free will, I don't know. Which? This part with the free will. Free will. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. Free will, <laughs> free will is based on the principle of love. And the principle of love is the connecting principle of existence. In other words, the whole idea of life is to love. Without love, there's no life. There's no meaning to life. Uh, those who don't experience love, either in the material or spiritual world, are just miserable. They're not even alive. Love is the purpose of life, and then love means relationship. So developing that relationship with Krishna in devotion awakens our natural love for Krishna. Krishna's love is always there. It's always coming towards us. We have to receive that by reciprocating it with our love. And our love is simply to be, to be conscious of him and connect everything to him in our devotional life and to hear about him 
and to become attached, attracted to him through the process of hearing about him. So the free will, uh, love cannot manifest unless there's free will. Love cannot be forced. <laughs> It can't be forced. You can't. You can force a child to do something at a certain point, but when it gets older, then it'll use its free free will to rebel against you. <laughs> so, therefore, only when you uh, you attract the principle of ex of relationship through the through the mood of love does love actually manifest. And then, what is it? What is that? You're using your free will in the right way. That's all. You can use your free will in the wrong way, mm -hmm. and Krishna gives you that, that opportunity. But it's also our nature, because we are part and parcel of Krishna, Krishna is Swarat. Swarat means he's independent. And because we ha are part of him, we have an element of his nature, and that is called Swarat in minute form. So you can't take that independent nature out of the living entity because it's part and parcel of Krishna. But Krishna is totally independent and we are partially independent. What is that partial independence? We can choose spiritual or material. That is our independence. And when we choose spiritual, then we act in devotional service and we choose material, we act in a variety of ways that are outside of devotion. So that free will is, is part of you. You can't take that, Krishna will not. I mean, Krishna can, can check your free will because he's all powerful. He can do that, but he doesn't because you know, he gives you a chance to choose. Do you want me or do you want this material energy? But Krishna is so kind that he persuades us to take him by coming in his transcendental form, by manifesting his, his, himself in the form of his holy name, by coming in the form of religious scriptures, by coming in the form of the pure devotees of the Lord, by coming in the form of the prashadam of the Lord. So he comes and, and then, if you don't get it out of all these, then he comes in the form of suffering. <laughs> and then he says, you know, when are you gonna get it, you know? <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> So then suffering is the ultimate, you know, teacher that, you know, you can't be separate from God. All you get is suffering, that's all. Those who, are, those who connect with the Lord never suffer <laughs> because suffering is simply a, a feature of the material energy. On the spiritual platform, there's no suffering. <laughs> yes, Madhu. Maharaj, we have this free view, but sometimes we feel like we desire something, but we feel like forced to act in certain other way. Mm -hmm. Like we want to change some habit, but you know we are pulled to, toward this. Yeah. So how to yeah. relate to the direction? I'll give you an analogy. Yes. You're driving a car. You're going down the road. You're going say 50 miles an hour. You come to a very big turn in the road. If you don't slow your car down, you won't make the turn. The turn forces you to slow down. So if you want to change the directions in your life, you have to slow down in the direction you're going. Because karma will push you, habit will push you in that direction. You have to slow down and recalculate, oh, I want to go in this direction. That means you have to slow down in the direction you're going and then look in the direction you want to go. <laughs> and that takes that takes what we say practice because habit is second nature which comes out in the form of our, 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 our karma. It looks like karma but in the same time karma develops a certain habit and that in that habit we act in a certain way or think in a certain way also. So then we just have to, well, I'm acting like this, this is my you know, condition, I want to change. So what do I have to do to change? Well, the first thing is stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> but that doesn't, that doesn't really work completely. It's just step one. Step two means 
to associate with those who you want to be like. See who has those characteristics and qualities you want to be like, and then go for that association. That is the most powerful way. You can do it without that, but it's much slower. But that takes great intelligence. Because your conditioned nature will again arise in circumstance. That's why we sometimes we tell devotees, don't go in this situation, because as soon as you're in that situation, you're going to again make that mistake. Avoid that situation. So we keep you away from the situations which provoke your, the, the things that you want to get rid of. Like sometimes, you know, just say, using this as an example, Prabhupada used this example. Uh, before you came to Krishna consciousness, maybe you smoked cigarettes. Okay. So, all right, so now you've been practicing and you're not smoking anymore. Then you meet your old friends again. And they, they want to talk to you and spend some time. And then they're smoking, they hand you a cigarette. So now you're back in that old element and you think, all right, <laughs> just to be sociable. <laughs> And you might also, and then all of a sudden, then, you, then after you do it, you think, oh, what did I do? This is a mistake. <laughs> but the environment causes you to act in a, so a way that is something that you gave up and you don't want to go back to, but still there is that, still that seed is still there within you. If, it, if that seed is not there, even in that association, it won't work, it, you won't change. But if there's that little seed, and you'll see that happens. When people are in certain situations, they act in according to that situation. But when they're outside of that situation, they think they're different, but they're not. They can't see the subtle aspect of their desires. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's why we say sadhu sangha. <laughs> that's how power, the most, Prabhupada said the most powerful and most effective way to become Krishna conscious is take association with advanced devotees. This is the most effective way. And the most, what do my, when you say the fastest way also. Association with devotees who are advanced in Krishna consciousness. But association with devotees in general is the foundation for our development in Krishna consciousness. But when you get when you get association with great souls, then that's the fast track. <laughs> How do we know who is advanced? Huh? How do we know who is advanced? That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. When you, when you want to develop a relationship with someone, you know, as you're developing that relationship, you learn about what are their characteristics, what are their qualities, what are their activities, what's their personality like. You get to know them. And then by basing, by getting to know, you can give an understanding of what they're like, what they do like that. So we have to understand what, what are the characteristics and activities of the great souls. That we have to know. A little bit. You can't know everything completely because there's certain things you can't see. Because unless we're on that same level, then you'll be able to see that. But there's certain but the characteristics that we see is that they make Krishna their number one focus in life. That's one of the great things. Their business is Krishna <laughs> only. They may do other things, but they connect everything with Krishna. Um, they don't find fault in others. And then they are adosha darshi. They don't see the faults of others. That's another quality of a great soul. Um, they're always they're looking always looking for an opportunity to glorify the Lord. They do it when they're with people and they do it when they're outside of the association. They're always either hearing the glories of the Lord, speaking the glories of the Lord, or doing some service to glorify the Lord. 
These are some of the characteristics of the great souls. And there's more. <laughs> These are some of the main ones, anyway. Mm, just like it was the brother of Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. He accepted Lord Chaitanya, but he couldn't accept Lord Nityananda. For some reason, he was not able to accept Lord Nityananda, and therefore he committed an offense. Now, Lord Nityananda has all good qualities, but he's also Abhiduta. He does things that are not, what we say, normally done by the Supreme Lord. In his leelas, you know, sometimes he'll he'll jump into the river and chase crocodiles, <laughs> or he sits on the lap of uh, of Shrivas Thakur's wife and acts like a little child. <laughs> She's an elderly lady, uh, so. Or sometimes he'll go into ecstasy and take off all his clothes and dance. He did that. Lord Satan, he got really concerned and ran over and threw his, door, his charter around him. <laughs> so he does things that, but that doesn't take away from his greatness. But if we try to do that, <laughs> you know, we would be a fool and be condemned for such things. So... Many greats, just like, I'll give you an example, how, this is another example. The devotees were in Calcutta. This was in the early, really early days of Krishna Kama. Prabhupada first took his Western disciples to India. So they got invited by one very prestigious person, nice Indian family, very nice family. And so they invited Prabhupada and all the disciples for, for prasadam. So they were distributing prasadam, and then the devotees noticed there, was, there were onion pukoras. Pukoras, but they were onions. And, you know, the devotees, you know, they, they said, Prabhupada, onions. Prabhupada said, never mind. Just eat. <laughs> Now, if we would have did that without Prabhupada's guidance, well, why did Prabhupada do that? He didn't want to offend the host. He didn't want to offend the host by rejecting some of the foodstuffs that they gave. That was Prabhupada's sensitivity. Now, and then another time when Prabhupada was, when a devotee was in Russia, and they were preaching in Russia, and they said to Prabhupada, there's nothing here to eat but meat. Prabhupada said, then eat meat, but preach. <laughs> now, we couldn't do that and give that same instruction and expect that to be, you know, valid. But Prabhupada could do it because he's on a transcendental platform. You can't understand the mind of a pure devotee. He may do something that appears to be something ordinary or even against religious principles. Tejasam Rajasaya is the actual statement. When the fire is like fire, if you get too close to the fire, you may get burnt. But if you put fire next to fire, fire doesn't burn fire. <laughs> so Prabhupada, when he, he is he's someone on that level of spirituality, may do something that it looks material, even against the principles. But it's not. From their perspective, it has a particular reason. And they don't do anything reason. But many times they will follow the ordinary sense in order to teach others because of that verse from the Bhagavad Gita that whatever a great man does, common men follow. Just like Prabhupada, one time Prabhupada, they gave Prabhupada some, some seven up. And seven up is like Limka from India. If you've been to India, you know what Limka is, right? It's a very 
you know, nice lemony drink. <laughs> and it's very popular in India. <laughs> and uh, so they gave Prabhupada some seven up, which is very similar to Limka. And Prabhupada liked it. And so after that, everybody, all the devotees start drinking seven up. <laughs> Oh, well, Prabhupada drank seven up. Okay. But then Prabhupada said, What is this? Why is everybody drinking seven up? So, you know, they just gave it to him, so he took it one time, and, you know, now it became, you know. But Prabhupada shut it down, said, This is not our program, you know. So you can't imitate the great souls, but then again, if they do something different, you have to understand there's a reason for that. <laughs> Does that make sense? My friend, I wanted to ask you, you explain about advanced devotee, uh, you explain externally, I mean, some behavior, some he is ethical, but what is, Sometimes this question to me come from inside. How they look at the world? At the, I mean, at the at everything. Mother, we can't imitate. I can't describe what what the vision they have. That's that's something. Uh, Matsya has his hand up on that. Um, I can't describe what they see, but we can understand that their vision is a lot different than what, what our vision is. They're not seeing the material energy. They're seeing Krishna in and within them spiritual energy. And they're seeing everything connected to Krishna. Mm -hmm. They have a completely different vision. And it's not theoretical. It's actually realized. Of course, there are those on the theoretical level, but those who are actually great souls, I mean, devotees could would say, when Prabhupada looks at you, you feel like, you're completely naked. What does that mean? He can see everything about you. The Bodhi said, oh, we all had that experience. I had that experience. Prabhupada looked at me too, and I thought, oh my God, what is he seeing? I'm going to run. <laughs> but his seeing is not judgmental. He's seeing you for who you are. He may also see what is about you that needs to be corrected to help bring you to Krishna consciousness. But it's like a doctor who is trying to treat a patient and he learns about the disease and so. The Prabhupada's vision, and the devotees would say that, and he, you know, he's looking at me and I, I feel like he's seeing everything about me. And that was a common thing when devotees had that experience. So yeah, Prabhupada's vision was not like our vision. But then again, there are those who are maybe not as, as uh, developed as Prabhupada, but they also have higher vision than we do, or higher understanding than we do. Matsya, do you wanted to add something to? Yeah, I appreciate that, it's, it's interesting points of view. Um, as far as I, I understand, there are different ways to look at this question, to answer this question. Like Shukran Goswami, who simply didn't care about naked women. Um, but then also in the first canto from chapter 7 until um, I think 14, the, um, the qualities of a devotee have been described mm -hmm. as uh, knowledge and renunciation. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's, that's something that um, Mother would appreciate, the internal attitude of a devotee looking through the knowledge and renunciation. Seeing everything in relationship to Krishna's knowledge. And what is the renunciation part? Uh, the uh, detachment from this world. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're detached from, from any forms of material activities or anything that is separate from Krishna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. So the point in these chapters is that we cannot see bhakti, but we can understand bhakti through symptoms. Those, yes, those symptoms. Yeah, and you look for the symptoms, the characteristics of these. But you know, these are some of the main things: is that they're eager to glorify Krishna, they're eager to serve Krishna. 
one of the qualities of a great soul doesn't waste one moment. That's on that. Those who reach the bhava platform, it's described in nectar devotion. One of the qualities of those on the bhava platform doesn't like to waste one moment of time and becomes upset if they find themselves wasting time. They, if somebody wastes their time, they'll become upset, upset at that person. <laughs> or they, if they see themselves also falling into that, they become upset. They don't, every moment they want to use for Krishna. It's actually something that's very, very strong in their character. It's something sometimes devotees would be have to travel with Prabhupada. So just before they would leave, they uh, Prabhupada would sit down to do Gayatri. It would be that time for Gayatri. So devotees would sit down and do Gayatri, and Prabhupada would finish real fast and get up and go. And if you and then devotees would, oh my God, Prabhupada's done already and he's leaving. He won't wait for you. If if he's going someplace, he's not going to wait for you. <laughs> you got to wait for him. And if he's ready to go, you have to be ready to go, <laughs> or else he'll leave you behind. <laughs> Now, I was, there's many stories about that. Prabhupada never wanted to waste a moment. And it was like, it's, it, it becomes almost fanatical when you see it. Every moment to be used for Krishna. <laughs> That's one of the characteristics of a great soul. <laughs> no, but there are many other ones too. <laughs> They don't say, well, do this, but I'm not doing this. They don't say that. They teach by example. <laughs> yes. Yes, Narada. <laughs> Ma, about this example that you give, I think it was Harikesh uh, Prabhu, and Prabhupada said, if you go in Russia, just eat. Yeah. And, yeah. But before a uh, couple months, it was one lecture, uh, one devotee who said that uh, uh, if your parents is uh, old and if you uh, depend on them, uh, if they are eating meat, uh, you must give them meat because they were scared about you when you were small and something like this. I'm sorry, I missed one point you were saying. It was some lecture in Croatia. Yeah. And, uh, we, and somehow they are not arguing with this. We were, we're not what? Somehow or other, we're not what? We don't agree. With Hmm? We don't agree with those. Oh, we don't agree, okay. And if you can comment on this, because uh, they after uh, explained that Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Maharaj was also uh, organized um, in some hotel where serving meat for English people that they can preach. And uh, all of this was an example like uh, uh, if your parents is old, uh, and uh, you depend on them, then you must you must cook the meat. And uh, if your parents are meat eaters and you depend on them, you must cook the meat. That's what was said about. If you depend on them. Yeah. And also that that counts as pious activity, and Krishna is very satisfied by taking care of the parents by cooking them meat because that's what they want. And you, you were not, you, you were not been able to convince them otherwise. And so that was s spoken in a lecture by one devotee who gave that. It was not in temple; it was outside. Mm -hmm. One of the most influential and prominent preacher. In well, I think that's, and that is definitely time, place, and circumstance. I don't think that's an absolute principle where everybody can should go along with that idea. You have to judge it accordingly. That kind of statement will somehow or other bewilder people who are very following the principles and think that they're outside the principles. But just like, for example, I, you know, I had one disciple and she had a daughter. And the daughter, you know, was eating meat. 
and her mother was cooking it for her. I just said, stop cooking it for her. But she dep she's dependent on me. She lives at the house. She doesn't have any... I just said, stop, that's all. And she did. And the daughter, daughter had to go out and find her other sources to get that whatever she wanted, to get that kind of foodstuffs. So, so you're using that example and saying that is authoritative, or what we say, acceptable, that these parents are old, they want me, they require it, you're dependent on them. You put all of these things together and then you can say, well, yeah. But the idea is don't be dependent on them. <laughs> if you become, if you connect, disconnect that dependence, then you don't have to perform these activities. Then you might say, well, they need you, otherwise, you know, they'll never be able to live. But I, you know, if I was in that situation, I would just find some way to somehow convince them by giving them other foods that are similar to me, taste like me, but doesn't, but it's not actually me. And, you know, we have gluten, we have, what is, what is it, Satan, so many of these different... Sorry. Soya, something. Because in another one, another sense, meat in, is not healthy. So you're also contributing to, you know, making that health go down. People get so addicted to a particular type of foodstuff that it becomes part of their body, and it seems like they they have to have it. Otherwise, they feel like if I don't have it, I get sick. <laughs> I need it. It's, a, it's just, a, just a, it's a particular type of conditioning over a long-term period of time. But if, you, if I put myself in, my, in that situation, I would, find, I would look for ways to, you know, not do it. <laughs> or do something different that might be satisfying. That's what I would do. Yes, Matsya? Yeah. Yeah. There was an initiative from just a couple of years ago, American Association of Doctors. I'm not sure how exactly what is exactly their their um, the title of their association, but it is American Association of Doctors uh, who pleaded to hospitals to provide organic vegetarian vegan diet for the patients in order to help them to recover better. I, I have that on my computer. Yeah. yeah. I've been preaching in jails too. There's one jail in California, it's completely vegetarian. <laughs> I think it's the only one, at least the only one I'm aware of. Well, I mean, you know, but, you know, what pushes the whole meat thing is the meat industry which is a very powerful, they have a very powerful insight within the government also. That's why they can keep pushing it. And they push their propaganda that if you don't, you'll get weak, you don't get enough protein, and then they give us so many other things. But it's the meat industry, they're very, very powerful. Otherwise, you know, you know everyone knows it's not so good. The karma connected with meat eating is is very heavy, really heavy. It's probably one of the cause, probably the cause of all the problems in the world is you know, innocent slaughter of animals in order to you know to produce meat to make huge amounts of money on that. Yeah, it's not it's not healthy and it's not karmically, you know. Kosher. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so should I end now? Or should we have, a, see if there's any more questions? George, you have a question? I have no question, I just say don't end, please. 
<laughs> Don't you? Well, that's up to you. That's up to you guys. You got to keep me going. Here. <laughs> Kita, what should I do? Should I stop? <laughs> Continue. <laughs> yes, uh, Rishab. 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 It's not Rishab. It's R Rishab. Rishab. Yeah, Rishab. Tongue, the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. And the tongue, the tongue has two functions, to taste and to vibrate. You see people, there's certain people who can't shut up for a minute, you know. <laughs> if you ask them to shut up, they go to sleep, you know. Sometimes I get onto the phone and I get on conversation with somebody like that. It's not a conversation. I just listen, that's all. <laughs> uh, can I say something? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, you're there. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, this, this tongue is very difficult. That's why... Mm, two things to control the tongue. One is prashadam, and, and the other one is to just speak. And as it says, austerity of speech is to speak truthfully, beneficially, avoid speech that offends, and can recite the Vedas or recite scripture regularly to support whatever you're saying. This is actually what they call austerities of speech. Gravity is one of the principles of the mind. It's, a, it's an austerity of the mind where you contemplate things. You contemplate life, you contemplate philosophical teachings, contemplation, and that develops a ter an internal mood where one can control speech much, much easier. Mm -hmm. And true speech is to speak, what is this it? What is that? Um, real eloquence, what is it? It says right here. This... Eloquence, and what does it say? Take, take the book up. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Essential truth spo spoken concisely is true elegance, eloquence. So, essential truth spoken concisely. Yeah. So, concisely or, you know, just to the point. It's like sometimes I ask people a question and I get, I get a whole lecture, you know, as an answer. <laughs> I just ask you where you're going. <laughs> All you have to tell me is where you're going, not where you've been or where you want to go or what you're going to do when you're going to get there. <laughs> it's like that, you know. And people, we have to learn to control that speech in such a way as just speak to the point. Get right to the point. And uh, that's, that takes practice. Mm -hmm. That's an art. But, you know, practice for those who have that problem, practice silence. Don't say anything. When you practice that for a while, your hearing will also increase. When your hearing increases, your intelligence also becomes sharper. And when you hear your, sharp, your intelligence becomes sharper, then you can use speech in a more concise and more direct way. I'm still practicing it, <laughs> trying to. Okay, so for the sake of concise speech, 
We'll say all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada ki jai. Mad Bhagavatam ki jai.